Hello and welcome to May I Risk Podcasts. My name is Ariski Daoud. I am pleased to share with you a four-part podcast series in the form of a free-flowing discussion with my good colleague Alessandro Bruno on upcoming elections in Africa. Uh, The recording took place on 26th January 2019 and we picked four countries, Algeria, Nigeria, Tunisia and Mozambique, to do an election preview and a sort of state of the state as voters prepare to choose their leaders this year. Uh, This first installment in Tunisia followed uh, followed by Algeria in part two, Nigeria part three, and closing with Mozambique in part four. Thank you. L- let's talk a little bit about elections. I think we picked four countries, each of which has a very complex environment. Two of them are in North Africa, which is home to... Uh, both the Jasmine Revolution and and uh, the Arab Springs uh, originally. Um, one is in the center of the of the continent, Nigeria, uh, which is facing a multi- multiplicity of problems. And finally, Mozambique at the very in the southern part of the country. Uh, interestingly, all of them have common you know common issues. Uh, namely aging presidents, whether it's Algeria, whose president is very old and may be re, uh, re-upping for another term, by the grace of God. <laughs> mm. uh, Tunisia also has a president who is over 90, if I remember. Um, the uh, N- Nigeria has a, a an old general also who wants to go, go back for the second term. Uh, Mozambique uh, is probably the youngest, uh, but still a country full of trouble. So why don't we start with Tunisia, Alessandro? What uh, what's your take there? Well, before I uh, forget, uh, yeah. uh, you mentioned age being a factor, of course, in Algeria, but it's also a factor in Nigeria. Well, the, absolutely. Uh, the, yeah, the outgoing president uh, uh, not only uh, is 76 years old, which is not that old, but... He is rumored to have disappeared for a while in London for unspe- unspecified medical treatment mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, substitute uh, replaced by a body double in uh, in Abuja, the capital yes, of Nigeria. So that's what uh, th- the rumors. Yes, the rumors uh, circulating in the uh, Nigerian sort of blogosphere. Yeah. But the one that Anyways. the one that takes the cake, you know, if I can use that expression. The birthday cake, the one that takes the, bur- the birthday cake is uh, Beji Kaida Sabsi, the president of yes. uh, Tunisia, who is 91. 91. 92. Yes. He was born in 1926. God bless. And he, uh, he, so, so you, you were talking about age. Uh, there's a common thread about these countries is the top leaders are old guys. Now, yes. it's a sign of two things. Either there's really no young guys capable of, of running and competing, or the establishment is the old establishment, the old guards, are absolutely in power and holding all the keys of uh, decision-making keys. Definitely there is that. But I also think that um, if you want to be the president or the prime minister of Tunisia right now, you have to have a very strong stomach. Yes. Because the challenges are ahead are monumental and uh, I don't think um, anyone uh, running for that job can expect to last too long indeed um, um, I I, the the country seems ripe for a second spring of some kind Mm -hmm. uh, of another revolt Uh, there is great disillusionment with what the democracy has uh, brought it, ha- it hasn't really anything for the majority of the population. Perhaps a handful of already Europeanized uh, Tunisians, particularly those living in the main cities of the north uh, coast, but uh, in the interior and in the south, I don't think anything has changed. If any, perhaps things have gotten worse. Yeah, I mean, there's been some interesting uh, discussion about uh, a number of commentary commentators. 
uh, including, I think, a, uh, uh, a famous uh, reporter in the New York Times uh, who wrote an op-ed who, who sort of uh, pleaded with the U.S. to provide financial support, uh, zero interest uh, loans, for example, uh, because, you know, in, in his argument, and I, I agree in, in, what, in most of what he says, is essentially Tunisia ought to be the, uh, you know, a, a good model to follow because they're essentially going the political way as opposed to doing what Libyan, the Libyans are doing, kind of, you know, killing each other in the streets. Uh, but the, 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 the tasks for the Tunisians... Uh, are daunting. I mean, you, you just mentioned basically uh, they are on the verge of a new revolt, uh, and I would argue that they have been through the UGTT labor union uh, calling, calling and implementing strikes and threatening uh, for more to come, uh, and, and with the leaders essentially not seeing eye to eye uh, on on policy matters. Is there a risk that the country that started the re- the Jasmine Revolution yeah. uh, that is that politically seems to be on the right path uh, risks to basically collapse and uh, and eventually so so uh, we'll see the collapse of basically the entire value proposition of the Arab Springs. There there is a phenomenon in Tunisia which is really it's almost unique uh, right now. We've heard of setting himself on fire and he played a video just before. Um, Christmas uh, in 2018, and um, uh, actually did set himself on fire after showing a bottle of gasoline on YouTube. Rather unbelievable. This is exactly the sort of incident that um, triggered the that set that was the spark on the uh, pyre uh, that prompted then the um, Tunisian revolt in uh, 2010 2011, but. Um, I was surprised to discover that there have been at least 300 such incidents since 2011 hmm. uh, of people setting themselves on fire. Uh, this time it made the news because he was a journalist, educated, went to university, probably did all the right things, and uh, should have benefited from, I imagine, one of the biggest beneficiaries of a, demo- a democratic revolution is a free press. But uh, instead, salaries in Tunisia are very low. They are around, um, on average, 300 euros per month for uh, a public employee. And they haven't gone up. And and uh, inflation, meanwhile, is rising. And there are few prospects for improvement. Because, for one thing, Tunisia, unlike um, some of the other countries that we're going to be talking about later does not rely on a major natural resource uh, for revenue. It does not have um, big resources of gas, and it does not have big resources of petroleum. So um, it relies only on what it can make, and um, tourism has not uh, reached the uh, pre-2000 levels. Uh, a few uh, uh, terror incidents in the past few uh, in the past uh, six years have uh, discouraged uh, travel, I think, um, and the country has not really picked up from where it was economically. Also, I believe prices of the one resource it has in abundance uh, and uh, that put it in the world uh, economic map was phosphate. I believe phosphate prices have um, not recovered yet from the the decline of 2011-2012. So even that front has not worked out. So Tunisia has... um, It really needs... The only solution I can think of, uh, let's call it a Marshall Plan, and that's what they've been calling it in the European Union, Um, strong support from Europe to, um, uh, to recover. Otherwise... Um, the Jasmine Revolution will uh, wilt, to use yeah. a flower term. When you look at the or the overall, you know, economic results for uh, for Tunisia, in general, the situation is not, uh, you know, it, it doesn't bode well. I mean, there are certainly sectors, to your to your point earlier, I think that uh, that may be doing better than others. There's there's been a pickup in uh, travel related uh, revenues. 
largely because it's uh, it's a rubber band effect really uh, from a very bad 2017 so there's been a pickup there there's some companies that have announced very good profits uh, one of them Cartage cement a, mm. uh, a major producer of cement in, in that part of the world saw its uh, rev- its its uh, its sales up uh, 37% in 2018 um, so you know so but in general if you look at uh, the areas where consumers are involved not necessarily again cement is a you know is an industry that may not necessarily automatically be tied to um, the salaries or wages that the public sector employees get but if you look at the automobile market uh, it's down by more than 19 percent in 2018 in, uh, in terms of the number of vehicles that were sold in the country and that indicates that even though some companies may be seeing progress in their in their business the the biggest problem for Tunisia is how do you deal with the public sector workforce and how do you deal with the employee base that that work for the government for the administration and those are the biggest and and if you look at the latest or the last um you know strike that t- took place last week uh, the strike was specific to the public sector, and so where wages are not able to keep up with inflation, not able to keep up with uh, with the wages that you see in the private sector. So I, I do agree with you, but there there's still uh, I think some positive things, but they're totally overshadowed by uh, the lack of economic progress uh, witnessed by your average public sector employee yes and um actually that's a very good point the uh, the, the the problem i see there is that uh, the private sector perhaps how much uh p- power or ability does it have to employ though how many jobs are available in the private sector in a country like tunisia or a country like algeria these these countries have relied on public sectors for decades and yeah. um it it really needs heavy investment um, in, if the private sector is going to pick up um, and therefore improve uh, salaries, we need investment from the outside and in disinterested investment. Too often, Europeans come in and foreigners come in to these countries with uh, a very exploitative mindset. Uh, we need uh, a, a more supportive mindset. And um, the IMF, in that regard, hasn't really been acting in most Tunisians interest lately that has added more pressure yeah yeah so. absolutely and, and and it's interesting because uh, you know just to uh, you know repeat perhaps what I said earlier uh, if you look at a, a major conglomerate in uh, in Tunisia it's a co- company called Pulina group holding um, it it announced a equal in 18 uh, percent a growth for its revenue in 2018 compared to 2017. Um, you know, sales, so, so many of these companies are doing well. I think the challenge that you see specific to Tunisia is the fact that the, the share of public sector uh, employees in, in a broad sort of labor force is is a phenomenal, it's enormous. And so, the ch- and so what you see here is you see a, an ongoing uh, food fight between labor unions and government, but it's mostly really between labor union and the, and the IMF. The government being sort of the uh, the you know uh, the, the proxy uh, player uh, in, in in an area where the IMF wants spending cuts, wants mm-hmm. smaller labor force in the public sector, wants a uh, cuts in subsidies. And, and so what you see in, in Tunisia and what ought to be the focus is how do you get the private sector increase its uh, its investments, but not necessarily increase your investments to, uh, you know, to improve your infrastructure, your physical infrastructure, but to also increase business so that you can hire more employees and you absorb some of the losses or all the, uh, the problems that are elsewhere being created by the ongoing fight between you know the, these various players. So, I think I think there there is movement going on, but there's certainly the old guards on one hand, the old story of carried by the IMF, which means 
cut, cut, privatize, sell, uh, lay off, downsize. That's the typical sort of uh, you know story brought by the IMF, like you said earlier, all these foreign folks. That's number one. And then on the other hand, the old guard being from on the, on, on, the, on, on the labor front, which is sort of the unions, that play an incredible role in Tunisia. In fact, as you know, the UGTT uh, was a recipient of the Nobel, Laure- uh, Nobel Prize. Y- yes. So they are absolutely emboldened, powerful. And the problem, if you are in the middle, let's say you're a prime minister or the president, how do you create a consensus on how to move forward? And, and that's the drama where that country is facing. And th- this is the thing, uh, consensus and interest. I would be very surprised if the elections draw more than 50% at, um, attendance. Because really? I think, Turn out, yeah. Because I, I think there might, even though democracy is young, I think uh, there, is, uh, there may have been too many expectations on what democracy uh, could achieve in countries like Tunisia, uh, not to mention the others that uh, experience the so-called spring. And um, I think there's ma- there's much disappointment. Now, I don't know if there'll be a reversal back to Ben Ali's finished, um, but um, potential for uh, collapse, a state collapse, is definitely there. And um, the elections, I think one of the important things to look will be the turnout. Because if we get a strong turnout, there is at least a sense that people believe that they can achieve things through the vote. But if their w- turnout is weak, then then it's time to worry. Because then uh, um, Tunisia has... Uh, one of the reasons why many uh, ISIS members were Tunisian... Um, was pre- be- most of them in surveys and questions in, in, after they've been arrested answered that they needed a good salary. Uh, ISIS paid well. So it's unfortunately uh, money, unfortunately salary that uh, always gets in the way of uh, uh, ideal, uh, idealistic um, uh, goals. So um, Unless the European Union steps in, and will the European Union step in? Very doubtful. It's in the European Union itself is in a mess right now, particularly those countries that used to help Tunisia before the spring, France and Italy uh, in the first place. Um, They they led investments uh, there. These two countries are now fighting each other in the European Union for influence in the Mediterranean uh, as well, and uh, there's a uh, little chance of coordination. Yeah. Also, I thought um, if Tunisia improved its situation, uh, especially the private sector and the public sector, it would probably attract many migrants. Many of those migrants that are now going to Libya to leave for Europe or Algeria or Morocco might want to go there. Uh, well, economic progress, when it's um, in these countries is uh, tends to have a, an interesting side effect because of the discrepancy in development that there exists through uh, in the region and with from sub-saharan to saharan uh, africa but that's perhaps uh, yeah and i agree with you i think the you know if 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 you look at uh uh, Tunisia's traditional friends, you wonder if who would you turn to to get the necessary help to uh, go through a smooth transition or, or continuity at least. And, and the answer is, you know, if Tunisia is looking to get support from partners, foreign partners, I, I think they better rethink that because it's not, to your point, it's not likely to happen. So you begin with the traditional uh, partners, the Europeans. And between Brexit uh, Germany's economy, uh, yes. you know, uh, showing slower growth. France with its uh, yellow vests. Italy with its with its with its very complex uh, politics. It's very difficult for the Tunisians to turn to the Europeans, uh, unless uh, it is about containing immigration. I think that's it's clear that you know anything that deals and that's with the. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's the only thing that Europe uh, will do. They may even offer uh, support and aid to Tunisia, but that aid will get into buying uh, patrol boats, 
maybe patrol airplanes, um, right, building right. new security uh, apparatus. I mean, sy symbolic that support that could not, will not uh, bleed into a Marshall Plan-like uh, program. So that's that that really deals with with Europe. Uh, you know, if if you are the Tunisian, you you go okay. Let's take a look at our Gulf partners, and 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 the the assessment there is even bleak. Because mm -hmm. you know that the Gulf partners are only about reshaping politics in Tunisia. There's been a lot of bad blood between the Muslim Brotherhoods, the, the Islamists and of the Tunisia, Saudis. And, yes. and, and, and the Saudis, but mostly the United Arab Emirates. That's been criticized by the Islamists in Tunisia, the Islamists in Morocco, the everyone that that used to be labeled, uh, you know, under the umbrella of the Muslim Brotherhood is seen by the UAE as yeah, a... Yeah, uh, in Tunisia. Exactly. And, and so, uh, who do you turn to? If you turn to any Gulf country, um, and by extension, uh, you know, Turkey, which has its enormous problems as well, I, I think the, the condition would be one that they would want to force you to make some substantial changes in, in your internal politics and support whatever agenda they have going on in the Gulf, like fighting the, the Houthis, etc. So, uh, you know, so yeah. you have two major partners out of the loop. Now, who do you have? The third one is the US. And frankly, with Donald Trump not knowing what's going on uh, and focused on his internal politics and the big picture with Russia, etc., it's very difficult to see the U.S. earmarking any substantial amount of support to the Tunisians at the moment. So if you, if you are in Tunis, really what's left? And you can, mm -hmm. see, you can see there's two major potential folks or partners that, or foreign countries or foreign powers that uh, are creeping up. One are the Chinese. Traditionally, they've been they've been anywhere where their where their money is taken. Uh, they also are facing a slowing down in their economy, but uh, they don't have a similar vision as the West in terms of well, let's save money uh, no. because the economy dictates. They would say, well, let's spend the money because the politics requires. And that's, uh, yes. that's that could happen. I've seen them, uh, air, you know, potentially spending billions of dollars, six, seven billion dollars in neighboring Algeria for a, a phosphate company in 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 the west of the country. Uh, so so they could be finding Tunisia as a as an, an interesting uh, window into North Africa influence. But the the I, one that's more interesting to me or is Russia. Um, Obviously, Sergei Lavrov is going to travel. Is going to travel to the region and is going to spend two days in Tunisia. So you better believe that it's not going to be a vacation trip uh, in one of those beautiful Hammamet resorts, but certainly one that will seek to shore up uh, influence uh, in Tunisia and elsewhere in the region. Well, I w you took the word the, the word right out of my mouth. I believe that Russia and China. Will be the will be the ones that uh, that will help uh, both Tunisia and as they have Algeria politically. One country that China I think has not penetrated yet. Uh, they have some influence in Algeria. I believe they even have a community, a Chinese community in in Algiers. Yes. Um, I, there is no Chinese community in Tunis yet, but that could quickly change. And they have lots of interests after all in Niger and Mali where they've invested heavily in infrastructure. They've built bridges and roads. And when the Chinese build these things, they tend to do them uh, often free and in exchange for a presence and infrastructure. So they, they set the infrastructure up so that they can uh, um, secure their resources and uh, um, establish uh, a kind of benign colonialism, let's call it. This is not a new template. I mean, this is something they've... The Chinese have perfected uh, very well in, in many, many African yeah. countries. Uh, the debate over yes. uh, you know, the value of Chinese uh, investments in Africa has, has been, a, it's been an ongoing. And so, um, and so yeah, so this is, this, is, this is a template they would want to... Oh, repeat. and uh, in the long term, the ch and the Chinese tend to think long term, there is an inevitable uh, challenge between... Uh, that's brewing between the United States and China, not just economically, but militarily, because 
China is the new rising power. The U.S. is the uh, the, the the established power. In history, we, there's something called the Thucydides trap. Well, I think we're going to have something similar by 2050, and the Chinese may want to establish a nice little base or a couple of little military bases and naval bases in the Mediterranean. What better place? Why not put them in Tunisia? I think um, that the Chinese uh, are going to be looking to the Mediterranean and, and one way that they can establish a military base is to secure a nice, comfortable spot in Tunisia, right in front of the American bases in Sicily. And I think the, the Russians are planning something similar. Yes. Uh, after all, they have their, their naval base at Tartus. What sort of influence do you see coming into Tunisia from neighboring Libya? I mean, we talked about all these uh, Western powers, the, uh, the Gulf countries, but uh, th there's a lot of regional dynamics. And, mm -hmm. you know, and the, probably the most important one is the Libyan influence uh, on the east side. Well, I think uh, China does not do things small. It's not going to... Tunisia is the, a comfortable place. It's uh, geographically the closest to Europe. It's The distance between Palermo and Tunis um, by sea, I think, is 90 kilometers. Really nothing. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's a very interesting um, geographic point, B beautiful. Also, Tunisia, unlike the uh, other North African countries, has a high percentage of agricultural land uh, already producing uh, very good produce, including they even make good wine in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, uh, I've enjoyed some personally. So um, uh, I think they, they, Tunisia would be a good beachhead um, Libya is too unstable now, but Libya has something the Chinese want as well. And during the Gaddafi period, they, the Chinese oil company was pursuing big uh, securing um, oil fields uh, in Libya. Uh, I, I don't think they've abandoned that project. I think they've just delayed it until some stability, which they may help to uh, provide. Now, we'll see what happens with the Libyan elections and whether some sort of agreement can be reached uh, to unite the two countries, the two uh, so the two regions which are operating as separate countries now. Uh, but I, I think uh, the, the Chinese are looking for a, a beachhead in North Africa and um, Tunisia um, has the right um, conditions. Going back to the election topic uh, the elections will be or are scheduled for late 2019 the uh, there are several wild cards in this um, one is sort of the role internally of, of the uh, labor unions in particular the UGTT labor union which really wants to influence politics so uh, the fate of the massive public sector uh, workforce is at stake and UGTT wants to use that workforce workforce to essentially uh, put forward its own agenda. Um, facing it is uh, the IMF's um, kind of agenda that's being pushed through the Prime Minister, through the government in general, uh, willingly or not. Uh, that's another issue. The uh, the third issue that I can think of that uh, really plays a role is the uh, internal political infighting within the political systems in Tunisia, whether it is the leadership crisis that has uh, been brewing for a long time within the, the, the ruling party, the ruling coalition called Nida Tunis, uh, the role of the Islamists. This is still something that... Uh, it needs to be cl hasn't been clarified. Finally, the role of uh, the foreign powers, um, uh, all of which has their or, or have their own issues, and you could eventually see the potential for a, a progressive penetration of the Russians and the Chinese uh, uh, in terms of how these two could influence politics uh, in the region. So, uh, th does that? Does that summarize? Uh, did I miss anything, Alessandro? No, no. In fact, I think we've broken some ground here because I, I uh, 
until recently, I had not thought about the the great strategic importance that uh, a North African uh, country could have for uh, uh, China. Yes, yes, um, and it's 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 a very valid point. It's uh, I mean, China. You know, there's been a lot of noise lately that that its economy is basically slowing down due to the the U.S.'s uh, trade war. Um, it still is a country that has enormous amount of resources and assets and money, and mm. uh, it, it will not stay idle and take that uh, slowing down as uh, as a sign to do nothing. In fact, they will no. continue on, and we, they, they probably will be much more active than the Russians. The Russians traditionally have been focused more on the broad geopolitical and the defense world. The Chinese, in contrast, focus essentially on economics, mostly economics, uh, mostly areas that deal with uh, uh, extractive industry, uh, large construction projects, and you, you'll see more of that for sure. On a personal note, I remember I was um, in the 90s invited to a number of uh, events, uh, social events at the Chinese embassy in Tripoli. Mm -hmm. And the diplomats they sent were very focused on on oil. They knew about oil and they all spoke Arabic. Wow. So even then, they had precise goals and they, they, uh, they, they used their diplomacy very strategically. All right, well, let's move to uh, neighboring Algeria. 